This week we have our first issue of 1994 and the launch of the next branch in the Mega Man franchise. Our cover game this issue is Mega Man X, with the art showing the transition from the Blue Bomber to X himself. In the letters column, we have two letters praising the Making Emp Super Empire Strikes Back article and one letter that didn't. Also, this issue, when it was published, came with a set of Punch-Out! Mega Man X pogs. Sadly, I do not have scans of those, so I can't show you them. We start off with our cover game. We get something of the boss order for Mega Man X, and notes on Dr. Light's upgrades within each of the level maps of the eight Maverick Masters. Mega Man X is a lot like the first Mega Man. The platforming is there, with a few tricks from later games like the charge shot uh, being retained, but without some others that had been introduced at this point in the main series, like the slide. You do, however, have a new navigation trick, the ability to cling to walls and either triangle jump up a wall, or to springboard climb up the same wall. As you make your way through the game's levels, hidden in each one, though some are more out of the way than others, or less, are power-ups from Dr. Light that affect how you navigate the levels. The designs of the levels have the same sort of precise platforming as earlier Mega Man games, with one slight difference. When an enemy's spawn point passes off the screen, should you move backwards, that enemy will respawn like a Ninja Gaiden. N. The problem is that Ninja Gaiden N lets you kill generic enemies really fast, whereas in this game they take several sh uh, shots, unless you use a charge shot, which can make bringing them down frustrating and can cause problems with some of the platforming. To be specific, you get situations, that you can get, but you do get in situations where the enemy is at the edge of a platform, they jump at you, attacking you and forcing you back, either through damage or you evading their attack. After they die, you move forward and hit their spawn point again. This then repeats endlessly unless you damage boost through the enemy. Next up is Flashback, a cinematic action platformer like Out of This World and Prince of Persia. We have notes on some of the early areas of the game. For all the crap modern games get for hand-holding the player, there's something to be said for the amount of guidance that Dark Souls gives. If you don't have maps, waypoints, a compass, a quest log, or anything else to tell you where to go or how to get there, the game does a really good job of designing the open areas of the game as some place where you can't easily get lost, and you are eased into the game gradually. And then once you get into the... when the world opens up to you, you still have a degree of context and landmarks and that sort of thing to help you figure out where you are and that sort of stuff if you're paying attention. Out of This World did that fairly well as well. It gave you a fairly confined opening area with the limited directions of where you can go, and that tutorialized you with the game's mechanics, the gun, the force shield effect, and that sort of thing. Flashback doesn't. It throws you in the deep end and hopes you can handle it. While I feel like this fits with the narrative because you're an amnesiac protagonist, this would be the equivalent of basing a game of doing a game based on the born identity that threw you in at a very hard fight scene, without any opportunities to ease into the combat mechanics, without any on-screen tutorials to tell you um, what the controls are, and not in the sense of a QTE like with the Telltale Adventure games or like with the Matrix Path of Neo where the opening fight scene exists as a combat tutorial and also difficulty selector by determining how what difficulty they should you should set for yourself based on how well you fare in that fight scene. Quick aside, I wouldn't actually mind a Telltale Adventure game based off the Jason Bourne novels, not the movies, the novels. Anyway, Next, we have Claymates, a platformer from Interplay that uses some of the same tech as Clay Fighters, and we have maps of the first four stages. Claymates has what is probably one of the steepest learning curves I've encountered thus far for a platformer. It goes from the first level, which does a really good job of introducing the player to several of the main animal forms we'll be using in the game, followed by a second level that proceeds to kick your butt with some fairly advanced platforming that the last level didn't prepare you for. And, like, I know that... PC game developers had been doing platformers by this time, and not just like in the UK and Europe with uh, the game for the Amiga and the ZX Spectrum and that sort of thing. We are, when this game came out, in the era of Commander Keen. It has made several Commander Keen games by this point, 
and they also did a fairly good job of setting up a pretty decent uh, difficulty learning curve in the early portions of the game, something that this title does not do very well at all. I get the impression that like the designers of Interplay had been pl played platformers before doing this game, but hadn't really put a lot of work into thinking about how platformers scale their difficulty in that aspect of the design yet. I wonder if GDC was around by this point and if you were getting GDC talks about platformer level design and tutorialization in platformers. I don't know. We have Soldiers of Fortune next, which is a console port of the Amiga game The Chaos Engine, designed from the Bitmap Brothers. Um, there is a really good video on the Bitmap Brothers on Kim Just uh, just this channel. I will put a link to that in the show notes and in the little sidebar thing. Anyway, there are notes on each of the playable characters and maps of the first two worlds of the game. While graphically, Soldiers of Fortune owes a lot to Gauntlet, it also owes a lot to Wolfenstein 3D. You make your way through the gameplay area in a top-down perspective like Gauntlet, gunning down enemies like you do in Gauntlet, with some enemies coming out of monster generators that you must destroy. However, in Gauntlet, there are a finite number of monsters in the level, aside from monsters coming out from monster generators, and you can tell where they all are. You'll see, you'll see the walls and see the monsters coming out of the monster generator and gathering behind it. And the system is tracking where all these monsters are at any one time, which is why home console ports of Gauntlet for the NES had significant performance issues, particularly when doing multiplayer. In Soldiers of Fortune, or the Chaos Engine, on the other hand, Enemies come out of monster closets at certain points of the level, and in particular this happens when you pick up keys or other items, leading to a bunch of these unlocking at once, forcing you to fight off enemies from all sides. I'd almost compare this to Doom if it weren't for the fact that the Amiga version of the Chaos Engine came out before Doom. That said, Soldiers of Fortune has a real problem. There are no continues. There are passwords that you get once you complete a world, but no mid-world continues, which is frustrating and makes the game hard to recommend. Otherwise, it would be a very, very easy recommendation. Next is Super Solitaire, which is a solitaire game on the Super Nintendo. I'm going to skip this game and just say that unless you're a console collecting completionist, you probably can too. In the classified information column, we have a invincibility code for Super Star Wars, which is absolutely much needed and appreciated for that game. We return to the Mario and Wario strips, with Mario and Wario vying for Peach's attention by trying to get her a Samus Aran doll. Next up is Only in Japan, an article on Japanese games that did not get a U.S. release. Some of these games did get releases later on other platforms, but others not so much. Of note is U.S. presidential election, a game where you try to get elected president, and as novelty picks, there are other countries' foreign leaders in the race as well, like Margaret Thatcher, of all people. This is for the Famicom. Then there is Oto Giri So, which is listed as, mir as mystery novel, which is a sound novel for the Super Famicom that was likely not licensed, not only due to the fact that visual novels had never really gotten localized here in the past, but because this was a sound novel, there was a whole bunch of voice acting that would have needed to be redubbed, which would have upped the cost. Next we have Barcode Battler for the Game Boy, and I'm kind of surprised this didn't come out, though considering the large peripheral involved, I do understand why. Mainly cost reasons. We then have Fire Emblem for the Super Famicom. I suspect this is due to the difficulty of the game. Shining Force had come out to the US by this point, and it had succeeded fairly well. And RPGs in general were, gener were doing well on the Super Nintendo, so it's clear the market was there. However, what Shining Force did not have, and what Fire Emblem at this point was famous for, is the permadeath mechanic, and that is a deal breaker for a lot of people. It's a reason why, well, Fire Emblem didn't really take off to the degree it has now until the 3DS installments, where permadeath was an option, not a automatic feature that, was, that you had set up from the very beginning. Next is Mother for the NES, which was originally planned to be released as Earthbound, was officially translated by Nintendo, but they stopped um, prior to its planned release date because it was getting pretty close to the launch of the Super Nintendo. And this release 
did eventually come out on the Wii Virtual Console, and I believe Wii U as well. Next we have Final Fantasy 2 and 3 for the Famicom, and Final Fantasy 5 on the Super Famicom. All of these by now have gotten official releases, but at the time, due to some of the mechanics, I can see why these games were not brought over. Final Fantasy 2's level up system and stat growth system is very obtuse and kind of grindy. And additionally, Final Fantasy 3, for how it handled its leveling up system, or particularly through the introduction of the job system, that also kind of adds a bit of crunch, which could be off putting. 5, again, same general thing, but I think 5 is more approachable in this regard than 3 is, which explains why 5 kind of got released first albeit for the PlayStation. And then we have Dragon Ball Z 2 for the Famicom. I own this version of the game and can tell you why this didn't port over. While the card battle mechanic behind the game is neat, the Famicom version, which is the version we're talking about here, requires you to spend cards to move and it's taken from the same pool, pool of cards that you use to spend in combat. And it can only have party members work together if they are moving together. Otherwise, they fight on their own. This is a mechanic that is completely eliminated in the Super Famicom version of the game, and it makes the game much more playable because of this. Next is the Power Index, a checklist of released and soon-to-be-released games with some loose release info. This article is probably a boon for collectors, though some titles, like the Super Nintendo release of Fight Magic 2, were cancelled. That game only got a console release on the Genesis. Next up is the member section, and you know it's the 90s because we have a Magic Eye puzzle opening this issue. Or Magic Eye Picture, rather. We have the top titles of 1993, determined by popularity debates among Nintendo of America's staff. We have 10 titles for the Super Nintendo, and then 5 each for the NES and Game Boy. We're st we start off with the Super Nintendo, going from 1 and counting down. We have number 1 is Star Fox. Star Fox takes the top spot due to the technical achievement of the game, with Nintendo basically doing Space Harrier one better. Number two is Super Mario All-Stars, which is pretty self-explanatory. Number three, Street Fighter II Turbo, the best version of the game thus far. Number four, Super Empire Strikes Back. Number five, Mortal Kombat. Number six, The Magical Quest, starring Mickey Mouse. Number seven, The Lost Vikings. Number eight, Batman Returns. Number nine, Secret of Mana. And number ten, Tiny Toon Adventures, Buster Busts Loose. We also have a handful of honorable mentions here. On the Game Boy, we have number one, Link's Awakening. Number two, Mega Man 4. Number three, Dark Wing Duck. Number four, Rampart. Number five, Kirby's Pinball Land. Finally, on the NES, we have number one, Mega Man 6. Number two, Battle Toads and Double Dragon. Number three, Kirby's Adventure. Number four, Jurassic Park. And number five, Yoshi's Cookie. We have another article on the sound hardware of the Super Nintendo. The focus is on how the Super Nintendo uses sound sampling instead of FM synth, or FM being short for frequency modulation, synthesis like with the Sega Genesis, though the Genesis is not mentioned, of course. This allows composers to basically compose their soundtracks directly in MIDI and then use the MIDI voices almost all uh, already in the SNES, and if you need new voices, you can put those onto the actual chips of the cartridge. Finally, we wrap up this section with some more Magic Eye style pictures. We wrap up the feature section overall with the preview of games set to come out this year. We have Super Metroid, NBA Jam, Ken Griffey Jr. Major League Baseball for the Super Nintendo, and Wario Land for the Game Boy. This is looking like a banner year for the Super Nintendo. Returning to the Super Nintendo, we have Battle Dodes and Double Dragon for the Super NES. The levels appear to be effectively the same, with some audio and graphical overhauls. As with the Nintendo version, this game runs into problems based around the fact that Rare hasn't made many brawlers, and so they don't have as much experience at making them, and consequently aren't as good at them as, as well, um, Technos is. All of the issues from before are present. Enemies are able to hit you when you're down or grab an enemy, recovery periods that are too short, and enemy animations that don't really give you an opportunity to do crowd control. I wish this game was fun. 
I really do, but sadly it's not. At least with the more traditional battle tones of games, they change from mechanics and goals in between levels, in some cases in dramatic degrees, while this game doesn't quite do that. Moving into Game Boy titles, we have Batman the Animated Series for the Game Boy. There are maps for the first three episodes, which are of varying length. This game plays incredibly well. The platforming is generally solid with a good triangle jump. There are some issues with the game's grapple, which you can only fire vertically and you can't swing off of for reasons that are not made clear. The game appears to have unlimited continues with some really solid checkpointing. Further, the music, sound effects, and cutscenes really evoke the look and feel of the show. Frankly, this is one of the best Game Boy games that I've played in a while. Next up is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 Radical Rescue. This feels like the game's structure is a little more non-linear. Based on the map, we get this issue of the structure of the fortress, along with notes on the first four areas. So, this is almost a Metroidvania. You start off with Michelangelo, and just Michelangelo, and make your way through this massive Foot Clan complex, rescuing the other three turtles, and eventually out April and defeating the Shredder. But to do this, you need to find keys that will open certain doors, and free various turtles, with each turtle having other traversal abilities. For example, Michelangelo can spin his nunchucks like helicopter blades to float across long gaps. It makes this game, of all the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles games I've played thus far, the most unique of all the games in the series, mechanically, and the one that really takes steps to make the turtles work as more of a team than just a bunch of individual characters with different strengths and weaknesses. Next is the Game Boy version of Tetris 2. Well, it's Tetris 2, and it doesn't have multiplayer, which takes away one of the big high points of the Game Boy version of Tetris 1. And considering that I didn't like Tetris 2 very much anyway, it shows that this one isn't particularly very fun either, at least not in my book. We only have one NES title this issue, with Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers 2. We have the premise that Fat Cat is broken out of prison, and we get maps of the first five levels. Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers 2 does a really good job of advancing on the concepts of the first game. The controls and mechanics are the same, it's just that the levels are now just a little more advanced, with the first level serving as something of a refresher course on the mechanics. Now that said, for some goddamn reason the game has limited continues, which doesn't serve any purpose here. However, since this game is available in the Disney Afternoon Collection, which has a rewrite re mechanic, if you play it that way, you don't have to worry about the limited continues. In Counselor's Corner, the look and feel has changed. We have questions about Shadowrun and Seventh Saga. In the top 20 column, Mortal Kombat holds the top spot on the Super Nintendo with a 10,000 point lead over Street Fighter 2 Turbo, and that's even with the lack of blood. The Game Boy version also has made the top 10. In the now playing column, among the also rans is Sengoku from Data East, The Lawnmower Man, and Metal Marines. In wrapping up this issue in Pack Watch, we have Super Adventure Island 2, Super R-Type 3, and Star Trek The Next Generation among our upcoming releases. My pick of the issue is Mega Man X, a good evolution of the Mega Man gameplay formula from the earlier titles. That said, we have some solid titles in the Game Boy and NES as well. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 is not only the best Turtles game on the Game Boy thus far, which would be damning with faint praise, but a solid Game Boy game overall. Further, Chippendale 2 is an excellent sequel, and it's a shame that we only got it so late in the life of the NES. Next time, we get Return of some Looney Tunes licensed games, of uh, the Sunsoft based right from the cartoons variety, a whole bunch of sports titles, and the launch of a new comic inside Nintendo Power, based on another very classic Super Nintendo title. See you next time.
Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.